Not anymore. <laughs> it was a long time ago that uh, I used to have a Takamini 12 string and a synthesizer and used to play around with instruments. And yeah, I worked in a worship community one time and worked with a worship leader and worship team. And it was fun, you know, but the greatest time that I had was that I used to go outside my door in Alaska, up on top of, there was a garage, and then on the back of the garage was a lean-to, and it faced the east, and it was just kind of a sloped roof, and then the peak of the other roof like this, I could put my head against. So I'd lay there, and I'd look up at the sky, and I'd see the northern lights, you know, and I would just play my Takamini, and I'd just go in for it, having a blast, me and God, alone. And during that time, I was going through some real struggles, some real challenges. I mean, it was tough. I was really, I was really needing the Lord, you know, and, and, uh, I was put to the test and challenged and didn't always come through the best. But I tell you, I once talked to a pastor friend of mine that he always likes to, I don't know why, but, you know, he always likes to tell me about different things. And so I was listening to him talk one time and, I finally said something about, uh, yeah, I said, you know, I used to write songs. And he says, really? Said, yeah. He says, well, you know, because he's a worship leader, pastor, you know, he's both. And sometimes I think he's a better worship leader than he's a pastor. But that's just my personal opinion. I'm sure I'm going to get flack for that. But, you know, I said, well, the Lord, you know, kind of led me into, you know, knowing the word more than knowing the worship. You know, and I was thinking, you should stick with worship. But, <laughs> but he asked me, he says, well, you know, you know, I remember you used to play songs, you know, and he says, did, did you write? So I said, yeah, I wrote 400. And he said, 400? And I know he didn't believe me. But you see, when I was in Alaska at that point in time in my life, I was desperate for God. And I don't know if you know what it's like to be desperate for God, but I when I was a kid, had a guitar that was, oh, not unlike this one, except it didn't have steel strings. It had nylon strings. And I used to just bang on it. And, you know, people would tell me, you know, well, that's a G or that's a D and that's a G and, you know, an A. And, you know, I kind of went to guitar practice and I hauled my guitar there and couldn't play it for beans and hauled it home and couldn't play it. No matter what I did, I couldn't play guitar for nothing. You know, they'd give me these, you know, picks, you know, and I'd try picking, you know, and just couldn't play it. And I went through most of my adult life, you know, thinking, man, you know, I can never worship the Lord because I could only do it when I was singing, you know, and I was in high school, uh, first soprano, so I thought I was pretty hot stuff until my voice changed. Now I can't really sing much, but I sing loud. But the point being is that there came a time where I found this Takamini, and it wasn't a 12 string, it was a 6 string, and it was pretty beat up. And... I was playing it, you know, unto the Lord, you know, just, God, you know, I just want to play this thing. I want to, I want to play these songs that, you know, that this pastor sings, you know, and I had this little, you know, three string, you know, three chord. You could basically reduce all songs to three chords, you know, if you know how. But anyways, he had all these songs, worship songs, reduced down to three chords, you know. And uh, if I say that he broke his string on a regular basis, you know, I'd give away who it is. Oops. But anyways... I just wanted to worship, you know, I, on my own guitar, you know. And so I used to, for about a year in Alaska, pray, God, give me the ability. God, give me the ability. And I never did. So then one day I had this Takamini, you know, and I was sitting there out on the porch stump, you know, and I said, God, if I can't play this guitar, I'm taking it over to that bridge. There's creeks that they get water in them pretty deep. But there's this bridge that, you know, kind of spanned this little creek. And I said, I'm going to walk over to that bridge and I'm going to throw that guitar in the water. Because I said, if I can't play for you, I'll never play this again. And so as I did, I just, my left hand just kind of went down and I started picking. And it was a simple pick, you know, at the time. It wasn't your normal pick your bass and then pick your one, two, three, two, one. Pick one, two, three, two, one. It wasn't any of that. It was beautiful. I loved it. I was like in heaven and I didn't want to look down. I played it for two hours straight. 
because I was so scared of what was happening that I didn't know what was happening. God just let me have the ability to do it at the time. And so I was thrilled, you know, and from that moment on, for about a year, every night I was writing something new and I'd write it down, scribble it and put some lyrics to it and put some scripture to it. And, you know, I wrote 400 songs, you know, and I had them in a book, you know, and I kept them forever. And now I kept a few, you know, there's not many left from those days. I could probably figure them all out again because they're all basically simple. Because I always believe that worship should be unique, should be from you to God, from what you can do, not from what others could do. So I'm kind of like the old Keith Green, you know, perspective on worship. I'm not into this modern day charismatic or you know, contemporary Christian, let's be in front of the people and crowds routine. I'm more like, hey, you know what, get away from the crowds so that you can worship. Because I got a feeling that, you know what, when you take away the guitar and you take away everything else, your voice is what's going to be those that worship God in spirit and truth. It's not going to be about your instruments and fancy guitar playing and everything else, but it's going to be just simply enjoying God for who he is. I think when God wants worship, he doesn't need our instruments. He wants to make us an instrument. When God wants to enjoy his people, he doesn't need our works. He wants us to be his work. When God wants to fellowship with you intimately, he doesn't need all the other things. What he really wants is you. Just the way you are. As simple as you are. Or as complicated. But God loves you. When I wanted it so bad, God gave me the ability to play the guitar. And I played it and played it and played it and played it and played it. And I, like I said, those 400, 400 songs, oh, I loved them. I was all had dreams of someday, you know, being in lights and going before worship and doing all this stuff. And when I got into a worship team, <laughs> wow, <laughs> I had to teach them to be humble and teach them. And it wound up being more of a teaching ministry than it was an actual worship team because they were all egotists, you know, and I'd already been in the college and career group at Calvary and I'd already seen the early makings of worship problems, you know, and worship egos, because I've been behind the scenes on Friday night concerts, and if any of you know what that's like, oh boy. <laughs> there were times where I still don't talk about what some of those Christians were like, Woo! but the reality of what happened in my life was that I didn't want to be caught up into that adoration from the people, which is what Satan fell from. I mean, he was a worship angel or covering angel. You could say he was one of the worship leaders. But I wanted to just express my heart to God. So I found myself, whenever I was in worship in normal church, in the pews, people would kind of like, you know, because I was always so alone with God that I guess people noticed. And I just couldn't help it. So now I spend more of my time alone with God than I do with people of God because I think that sometimes they get carried away about into worship rather than to who they worship. They hear what the unjust judge saith, and shall not God avenge his own elect which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I will tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Luke 18, 6-8. God's seasons are not at your beck and call. 
God's ministries are not at your beck and call. As a matter of fact, God's anointing is not at your beck and call. In fact, God's gift is not at your beck and call. And the Holy Spirit is not at your beck and call. Imagine that. If the first stroke of the flint does not bring forth the fire, you must strike again. God will hear prayer, but he may not answer it at the time with which we, in our needs, in our minds, in our wants, have appointed. He will reveal himself to our seeking hearts, but not just when and where we have settled it in our own expectations. Hence the need of perseverance and importunity in application. For me, in learning to play the guitar, though I had gone to school, though I had been, quote unquote, wanting for so long, I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and finally God gave it to me anyways. But you know, when I got into worship and I was practicing regularly and I got, you know, my calluses on my fingertips and everything, my arthritis in my hands started getting worse and worse and worse to where, you know, my hands started looking a lot like this because I would have to take my thumb and pull it out because of Crohn's disease that I have. Part of the consequence of the disease was that there are things I can't do. Or if I do them too much, I can't do them anymore. So gradually I could no longer play the guitar. Gradually I could no longer play it for long periods of time or sets. And slowly but surely that was taken away. But I still got what I wanted when I wanted because I kept petitioning and petitioning and petitioning like the unrighteous judge gave the woman her request. Be careful what you ask for if it's not what God wants you to do. Because he may give it to you, but unless you give it back to him and he anoints it, you're just making a lot of noise and you're not accomplishing his purpose. In the days of flint and steel and brimstone matches, we had to strike and strike again dozens of times before we could get a spark to live in the tinder. And we were thankful enough if we succeeded at last. Shall we not be as persevering and hopeful as to the heavenly things? We have more certainty of success in this business than we have with our flint and steel, for we have God's promises at our back. Never let us despair, for God's time for mercy will come. Yea, it has come, if our time for believing has arrived. Ask in faith nothing wavering, but never cease from petitioning, because the king delays to reply. Strike the steel again and make the sparks fly and have your tinder ready. You will get a light before long. I do not believe there is such a thing in the history of God's kingdom as a right prayer offered in a right spirit that is forever left unanswered. Because you see, the answer may be that even in when you get what you ask for, whether that be your ministry as a worship leader, it may be that God wants you to give it back to him so that he can make you a minister of worship leaders as opposed to a ministry of worship leading. Because sometimes, maybe, maybe in waiting, maybe in asking, Maybe in wanting something so bad that God will take that desire, honor it, but give it to you in a way you never thought of before. You see, I love the fact that I can sing to the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength and passionately dance before him like no other man that I know of dances the same way that I do or sings the same way I do or plays the guitar the same way I do. But I don't need the applause of men, but rather... I enjoy, oh, do I enjoy, I enjoy when my God smiles, when my God hears, when my God listens only to me in the midst when thousands are around you, God bless you, but when you're all alone with God, 
when you're all alone. I mean, when there's nobody else there. No one can hear and no one can care. When you offer up that praise and that joy, that love, that passion, that feeling, that ability, huh, that's worshiping God in spirit and in truth. Because it's just you and him and no one else knows. No one else hears. And no one else sees.